Shabbat Shalom again. For centuries, philosophers and theologians have insisted that for a society to be rooted in a moral core, it needs to share a widespread belief in one singular notion. And of note, that belief is not one in God, but rather in free will. The idea of our human ability to freely choose between right and wrong is the foundational rebar, as it were, of a collective moral sensibility. It's why Immanuel Kant ultimately argued famously that if we are not free to choose, then it makes no sense to say that we ought to choose a path of righteousness. This notion of free will is also one of the most important underpinnings in our American society. It permeates our politics, social services, criminal law system. It's actually what birthed the American dream. Contrast this, though, with the scientific world, whose research essentially proves that our human will is anything but free, and in fact proves much more, if not entirely, deterministic. Back in the 1980s, researchers demonstrated that the buildup of electrical activity in a person's brain occurs before the person consciously makes a decision to physically move. The conscious experience of deciding to act, that idea that we associate with free will, when you study the brain, that appears to be an add-on, a post hoc reconstruction of events that occur after the brain has already set the act into motion. Renowned Cambridge philosopher Stephen Cave sums it up this way. In principle, we humans are completely predictable. If we could understand any individual's brain architecture and chemistry well enough, we could, in theory, predict that individual's response to any given stimulus with 100% accuracy. Which leads us to a frightening question. If moral responsibility depends on faith in our own agency, but free will isn't real, won't we become morally irresponsible? And the answer to that is also known and proven, yes. Extensive psychological research consistently demonstrates that when people stop believing that they are free agents, they stop seeing themselves as blameworthy for their actions. Consequently, they act less responsibly and give in to their baser instincts. Those with a weaker belief in free will are less likely to help a friend in need, less likely to give charitably, they have diminished empathetic capability, they are more stressed out, they are more unhappy, and they even perform worse academically. So on the one hand, free will factually isn't real. It's a construct. But on the other hand, an ordered good society depends on its members believing in it. So what's a human being interested in both truth and goodness to do? about just such a quagmire. Well, we might look to the depiction of the development of one of the key characters in the Exodus story for some guidance. Not God or Moses, as you might assume, but rather Pharaoh and the depiction of his deteriorating heart condition. So what was the condition of Pharaoh's heart? It's a real question. Anybody know his heart condition, the diagnosis, the description for it? Hardened. There's some like technical term for like hardened arteries, but this is more of a spiritual cardiac condition. He suffers from a hardened heart. And it's described this way in that terminology, particularly after each and every plague 
that God sends. But what is the cause of Pharaoh's heart? What is the cause of its hardening? At first, namely after the first five plagues, the Torah tells us Pharaoh hardens his own heart, seemingly through his own free will. But beginning at the sixth plague, the text changes how it describes the condition, and all the way through to the end, the text reads that Pharaoh no longer hardens his own heart. Instead, God hardens his heart for him. Now, this idea that God ultimately hardens Pharaoh's heart is the source of immense concern for commentators throughout the ages. Why? Because if God is the one hardening Pharaoh's heart, meaning Pharaoh isn't making the choice to harden his heart himself, is he really still responsible for his actions? 20th century psychologist Eric Fromm puts it this way, Pharaoh's heart hardens because he keeps on doing evil. The longer he refuses to choose the right, the harder his heart becomes until there is no longer any freedom of choice left in him. His condition evolves. But 13th century rabbinic texts share a different view. And in some ways, it's as if they knew this free will research already. Listen to these words from the 13th century. A person becomes the result of their actions. Their thoughts will naturally follow the actions that they perform, whether they will be good or whether they will be evil. Their thoughts will follow after their actions. We tend to think of Pharaoh's role in the story as one of villain for the evil he commits. But what if instead he is villain because the shift from Pharaoh's hardening his own heart to God hardening it for him actually represents the shift from Pharaoh believing in free will to his rejection of it. That the message embedded under the surface of the story is one elevating the critical importance of a belief in free will and therefore moral accountability. Remember what the research shows is that when a person stops believing in free will, that's when things go south. We need to remember, though, that determinism is not the same thing as fatalism. Israeli philosopher Saul Smolansky notes that any thought process, including information, at any point along our lives is a sensory input like any other, and that contributes to how we act and think, even deterministically. These inputs have the power to change our behavior, even if we are not the conscious agents of that change. He says this, in the language of cause and effect, a belief in free will may not inspire us to make the best of ourselves, but it does stimulate us to do so. If you think about it, is it really such a problem to believe in free will even if it isn't objectively real? We actually do this all the time with so many other social constructs in our lives to provide structure and meaning. Think about it, love, time, borders, what's normal and abnormal. Free will is no different. But belief in free will might just be the most spiritual, or dare I say faithful, belief a person could have to benefit the condition not only of their own hearts and souls, but even more so that of their larger family and community, not just in their own time, but precisely because of the fact that so much of our identity and how we act is the result of what we inherit, so too for the generations to come. A different way of thinking about Lador Vador as influenced not by so much of what we do, but first by what we believe. 
Shabbat Shalom.